everyone. Welcome to another episode of Still We Persist. We are continuing our Prism of Feminist Lenses series. I'm one of your co-hosts, Shina. And I'm your other co-host, Mia. Um, we can move into a, a land acknowledgement from here. Um, and I will give the land acknowledgement for Oregon State University, um, which is where I'm coming from, the Corvallis region. Um, we're located in the traditional homelands of the Mary's River Ampanefu Band of Kalapuya. And it's important to note that following the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855, Kalap Kalapuya people were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon. Today, those living descendants are part of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. So we'd like to give that acknowledgement to have a space to recognize the lands that we're on. And I'll pass it off to you, Shaina. Yeah, thanks, Mia. I live in what is now called Louisville, Kentucky, specifically the Jefferson Town neighborhood, which includes the homelands of the Shawnee Eastern Band of Cherokee, Adena, Osage, and Hopewell people. Through actions by colonizers, um, including legislation, many uh, indigenous individuals were forcibly removed from these lands. However, many members of these nations remain in Kentucky, and I would like to acknowledge that I'm on their traditional homelands. And today we have uh, Risako Sakai with us, and I'm really excited to talk to you, Risa. It's, it's going to be a serious conversation, but I think our audience can learn a lot, so welcome. Thank you, Shaina. Um, so, hello, everyone. Nice to meet you. Um, so, my name is Risa Kosakai. I usually go by Risa, so people call me Risa. Um, just going to introduce myself and my language, too. So, and Shaina, and um, so I just introduced myself in Okinawan language, which is our indigenous language. And also like to acknowledge that I am on um, a stolen land, which now known as Corvallis and which is um, Kalapia people land. Um, so I am an uninvited guest here. So this is very honor for me to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we're really glad that you could join us today. Do you mind starting out um, just telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, so I am a fourth year student, I mean, PhD student in applied anthropology. I use she, her, her pronouns. Um, maybe it might be helpful to share why I'm here on Tidal Island <laughs> as an uninvited guest. So, you know, I am originally from Okinawa, uh, which is like, which is located in southern part of, of Japan now. Um, so I was born and raised in Okinawa. Grow, growing up in Okinawa, I always felt something was missing or something was wrong because there were always um, American soldiers and in bases. There are so many arguments over the existence of or presence of military bases. Um, I saw pro military base or you know, against military base, uh, we kind of like divide and conquer by um, dual colonialism by Japan and the US, uh, which I can talk more about later. Um, so, you know, even in, in the language, uh, you know, my family told me our customs in an Okinawa language, but at a school we are supposed to speak Japanese, like perfect Japanese. <laughs> Otherwise, like if unless you speak perfect Japanese, you're not gonna be successful. So, so I feel like something wrong because like I learned those my culture and my customs in my language, but this language is kind of denied at institutions. Um, and then also I have encountered some Japanese people telling me like, I have a thick accent in Japanese, like exotic accent. <laughs> um, so I usually kind of cold switch when I speak Japanese to Japanese people. Um, so that is the first layer to unpack when it comes to Okinawa, I think. Um, then American, 
as I touched on the American military bases and soldiers have been always there since I was born. So growing up there, it was like, this is what it is. But I feel like, no, this is not what it is. <laughs> um, so especially for women, uh, we have been exposed to violence in many ways. Um, and then, you know, violence is everywhere and every day. So um, yeah, and then especially like even during this pandemic, American soldiers go out and then enjoy themselves while our people are dying. <laughs> so, you know, because um, military base actually uses Okinawa as a uh, rest and then recreation place. Um, and then also my people died, like so many people died during World War II, which I can also talk a little bit more about later. I hope that makes sense. Or do you have any questions? I have so many questions. Um, let's let's start with. Do you mind explaining a little bit more how the U.S. military presence in Okinawa endangers girls and women's women there? Sure. Yeah, I can talk about it. Well, I think I should start with the history because that could explain more. I think. Um, so as I said, Okinawa is located in the southernmost part of Japan. Um, so Okinawa is likely to be seen as like just a part of Japan or like the region of Japan. But Okinawa used to be an um, independent kingdom called Luchu Kingdom, uh, but a colonized by Japan. So the Luchu Kingdom was established in 1429. And then in 1609, Japan, particularly the southern part of Japan called Satsuma started colonizing the Luju Kingdom for the economic purpose. Um, then between 1872 and 1879, yeah. In actually in the year of 1879, the Japan officially annexed the Luju Kingdom and they and then named it Okinawa uh, Prefecture. So the so prefecture is like a state in the US. So um, then World War II took place um, between 1939, 1941, or, you know, which ended in eight, uh, 1945. <laughs> um, but the US soldier landed Okinawa. So only Okinawa, they landed on, on Okinawa. Um, then also um, the Japanese military used Okinawa to, um, as a breakwater. So they intentionally prolonged the battle in Okinawa in order to lessen um, major assault in Japan. Also, our people were taught to die instead of being like, um, you know, called by these US soldiers. Um, so like that would be unpatriotic. So, you better die. So that's the, that was the education, imperial education. Um, so as a result, uh, one in four Okinawan people died during World War II. And then some of my family members also died during the Battle of Okinawa. Um, and then right after the World War II, the US, uh, US military occupied Okinawa until 1972. So um, in 1972, Okinawa rebutted to Japan um, because Okinawan peoples were hoping that uh, Article 9 of Japanese constitution would help us get rid of all US military bases in Okinawa because the Article 9 of Jap the Japanese constitution outlaws any forms of war and military. But here we were still, we still forced to host the US military and the Japanese self-defense forces. Um, so yes, then, so yeah, I feel like since World War II, we've been exposed to violence um, by the US soldiers and the military. Um, and then, you know, especially after World War II, Many of us are um, 
really poor. Many men died uh, because they went to war. And then if they didn't go to war, they were seen as unpatriotic. So they couldn't do that. So many men died and uh, women have to, you know, how to support their families. So, um, so many women became prostitutes after uh, World War II. Um, but, you know, in the, in the regime of military, women are likely to be seen rewards you know, this is like you were conquered. You were supposed to serve us, serve wars kind of thing. So that happened to Okinawa. Um, yeah, I can talk more about it if you're interested in. I hope that makes sense, the history. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm. Mean, it also is very, uh, it's familiar. And not that this has happened like to me personally, um, but just it, it sounds familiar to the U.S. Um, colonizing Hawaii as well, and there's a lot of other colonization stories also, and also recognizing that this is different too, and that it's Okinawa and Japan and, and U.S. relations all intermixed. But um, yeah, it's really sad, Risa. Um, it's really sad. And I'm just wondering um, how have Okinawa people been able to survive and resist also, you know, if that has been possible? Yeah. Um, well, I think I should also note that, um, you know, during World War II, Okinawan women are also taken by Japanese soldiers as comfort women. Uh, this is not well known, but yes, yeah, some of our ancestors are taken by them and then forced to be their comfort women. Um, so which, it has been really challenging for us, to be honest. Um, it's really hard to see what's going on in Okinawa. Um, we have um, highest rate, like worst rate of child poverty. Um, poverty is a really, really um, big issue in Okinawa. Um, and then also the Japanese government is reluctant to acknowledge our history. They just tell like, oh no, you've been part of Japan, you know, which is not true. We used to be like an independent kingdom and we still practice those indigenous practices. I mean, cultures and we try to revitalize our languages. So um, um, when it comes to resistance, I th yes, our ancestors have resisted in many ways. So, um, you know, like language and then customs, we still practice those things. And um, some people have organized um, protests as well. Um, yeah, still there's ongoing protests in Henoko because the US military is trying to build a new base on the ocean and then even there was a refer the re referendum in 2019, and then more than 70% of us voted against the relocation plan to Henoko. But very next day, the, um, the Japanese government launched the landfill. So there has been protests going on there. People are like, it's sitting protest. Um, but the Japanese government keeps sending um, police officers to remove those sitting protesters. Um, but there's also a successful case, for example, in Onason, I think it happened. It took place in 1970s or something like that. And then the US military trying to build a new facility in the village, and, but people organized 24 seven vigil and then they succeeded in keeping their land. 
Um, so there's hope, <laughs> um, but also there was a, like a violent um, protest as as well, especially like, um, you know, I think it was in 1995, 12 years old girl got kidnapped, raped and murdered. She was abandoned on the street. <laughs> um, so yes, um, so that was big protest too. So there have been multiple protests going on. So it's been a long process, but we are trying to keep resist. <laughs> Mia brought up that you know, what you're describing and thank you so much for explaining the history. I think that that context helped me understand a lot. Um, I was going to say the complexities, but really the complexities are coming from the imperialistic side. It's it's not like the people of Okinawa are choosing any of this, um, but I thank you for explaining that context. And um, like Mia mentioned, I can see that similar things have happened to other indigenous people around the world. So if it's okay with you, like, do you see connections between your people in Okinawa and other indigenous struggles around the world? Yeah, definitely I see that. Um, so um, to be honest, like it's kind of reason for us to recognize our indigeneity because the Japanese government keeps trying to hide the history and then try to rip off our identity. Um, but as I said, growing up there, I felt like something was missing or something was wrong. So, and then it's really hard to see uh, if you live in Okinawa because all you can do is survive. Um, so I decided to go out. Sometimes like having a distance helps us look at what's going on, you know? Um, so then I started learning more about our history and then what struggles and like, why are we struggling, you know? Um, then, um, you know, I started seeing similarity in like social, cultural, or political struggles in indigenous communities and a similar histories of like colonization, assimilation, um, ongoing oppression. And then um, I started interacting with some other like indigenous scholars or activists. And then I was like, yeah, this is what's going on in Okinawa. And then, um, Luckily, I have got other Okinawan folks, including Okinawan diaspora people who see indigeneity and who strive for indigeneity. Um, so we've been working together, so which is great. I'm really grateful that I got to know them. Um, and then it's really interesting to see, especially those who are aware of Okinawan people's indigeneity, they have interacted with other indigenous communities. It's like a moment when we, you know, recognize our indigeneity and then, oh, this is what's going on in our community too, you know? Um, so especially like poverty and then um, addiction and abuse too, like those are, you know, those stem from colonization. Um, so when I, got to know indigeneity and indigenous struggles and you just resistance and then sovereignty movement as like you know everything clicked yeah do you want to take the next question or should i yeah um i was still processing everything um yeah risa um you talking about like your like okinawan uh resistance and and how um like sometimes being there, like it's hard because every day it's just like, just trying to survive. Um, and you also said like being at a distance is helpful to like see everything in the whole picture. Um, so I feel like there is probably like definitely a lot of room for 
allyship, so not all the heavy weight of resistance is being put on oppressed people, in this case, Okinawan people. So like, what do you see um, like other people doing to, to help this, um, and to help like spread awareness about this and to make like some positive changes um, so Okinawan people can be sovereign if that's, you know, the goal. Right. Um, yeah, it's really complicated because of dual colonialism. It's really hard to see in Okinawa, like, oh my God, like we are dealing with both power <laughs> on an everyday basis. So yeah, I think understanding our history is one thing understand uh i would definitely appreciate if people more people understand uh the history of okinawa and then stop seeing us as as a as just a region of japan you know um and also sorry going back to the history like in 1955 which was under u.s occupation a six-year-old okinawan girl was kidnapped raped and martyred and then that's now known as Yumiko Chang incident after the girl's name. And then protests took place, place right after that because so many US soldiers were doing whatever they wanted to do and then didn't get arrested or they just got sent to the US and then they were just like freedom, you know? Um, so then, Many people question like, why then you decided to revert to Japan, you know? So that's why I wanted to emphasize because there is the article nine of Japanese constitution and then Okinawan people believed this constitution might help us get rid of all US soldiers. But what they did, it was just like, they are still using us, you know, to host, um, to host, the US military bases. And then, you know, when I was, the first time I got hit on by a US soldier, I was just 14 years old, you know, which was like, I got so confused when I was 14. I was like, I'm still 14 and then you're trying to go on a date with me, you know, like that was so weird. But because of patriarchy and then colonization, you know, it's easy to blame victim, you know? Oh, what were you like wearing? Or what did you do? Maybe you seduced him or something like that. So I was like, something was wrong. <laughs> um, so this is really bad uh, when it comes to women and girls or, you know, um, so victim blaming definitely that's going on. And then I've seen some cases too, um, many survivors are uh, not willing to report that incident because uh, victim blaming and like stigma on survivors, so that needs to be changed. Um, so yeah, um, you know, feminism is really important when it comes to, um, you know, the situation of Okinawa. Um, so, well, you your question was like what American people can do, right? Sorry, I was losing the question. Yeah, um, how others can support Okinawan right. people from the outside. Yeah, so the first thing was like, yes, please do not see us as just a region of Japan. Um, although like our indigenous movement is kind of reasoned or small, we've been, um, you know, striving for our rights or our recognition and then our resurgence. I think that's the main goal, like indigenous resurgence. Because when we just focus on rights and then it's kind of like gift from our nation state. I'm like, no, this, this is what we deserve, you know, already. So I feel like in, in my research, I did, did, that's why I kind of, emphasize resurgence for the non rights. Um, also for people in America, in the US, um, I 
think it's important where your taxes are going and you know and then educate yourself where the u.s military are located outside of the main land of the u.s as mia mentioned even in hawaii american samoa and guam guam um you know and then military itself contains structural violence you know picture patriarchy um you know um binary system and then yeah so it's important what military is and then how what they're doing and then also do not take your freedom and privilege for granted at the expense of our suffering um so i totally understand recently it's really really hard to you know tune in all social media all news like there's so much going on so i totally understand you can tune out when you need you need to rest but make your sure make sure to tune back in what's going on so for example in hinoko um we've been trying to hold the the um the new plan the government is trying to use the soil that contains um contains the bones of those who who died during the battle of okinawa during world war ii they are trying to use that soil in order to build a new base so they are trying to kill them twice and then they're trying to build a new u.s military base on their you know their bones or their bodies so, which is very, very disrespectful, but I don't feel like enough people know about this. Um, so what you can do is reach out to your representatives about what's going on in Okinawa. And there's some websites which I can share with Shaina and Mia later. Um, there are some websites that automatically generate emails to represent, represent it for you. Um, there are some documentaries about Barobo Okinawa, Henoko, and um, yeah, and then especially one person who uh, did a hunger strike to hold the plan of the soil use. He's been um, collecting those bonds and then trying to return those bonds to the families. He's been doing it for more than a decade and um, so when he did hunger strike, he was, I think he's like, he's in his seventies or eighties. So we were really concerned about his health, but he decided to do it because this is not okay. So that was really brave move. Um, and I really, I really wish I could support him. Um, I could have supported him, but I was in the US and then because of this pandemic, it's really hard to go back. Um, so yeah, that's what's going on. And then, so yeah, I definitely appreciate if people can do some research on Okinawa. And there are some Twitter accounts that are actively uh, reporting what's going on in Okinawa. Um, so that's a one way. And yeah, and then also when it comes to militarization, they, occupy our lands so that means they have been contaminating our water and land too um so learn about the laws too that allow these military behaviors so for example in okinawa in 2016 the okinawa government found pfos chemical i cannot remember what stands for but this is a chemical um which international treaty prohibits because it's badly affects women's bodies and babies. But in 2016, they found it. And then this, the international treaty was established in 20, 2009. And then this chemical keeps contaminating our land and water. Um, in addition, there are special laws 
Um, in Okinawa, that allows U.S. military to conduct their trainings whatever or whenever they want. So even like at 11 p.m., we can hear some hel helicopters going around. They're doing, it's so much noise, so much noise. I couldn't even understand when I was there. And then I still saw them doing their trainings at 11 p.m. Like people were sleeping, <laughs> but this, these special laws allow them to do it, whatever they want to do. Um, so yes, I definitely appreciate if people can learn about what's going on. And then also I, so I keep talking, but feel free to chime in. Uh, I have met some people who proudly told me like, oh, I have been stationed in Okinawa. Please stop doing that. <laughs> like, I'm not gonna celebrate that. Um, if you like try to understand what's going on, like, oh, I've been stationed in Okinawa and I felt something what's going on or something like that you can use your empathy, then you can say that, but do not proudly tell Okinawan people like, oh, I have been stationed in Okinawa, that was a paradise. Yeah, many people describe Okinawa as a paradise, but paradise from whom, paradise from what? <laughs> that's our home, that's our, you know, our sister's land. So yeah, I hope all of that made sense. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it very much made sense, Risa, and whatever resources you send us, we can put that in the description for the video and on our social media, because, you know, one, just as a global community, you know, even if we didn't have the American military connection, we should care what's happening everywhere, but in this case, like, as an American, I'm complicit, you know, my taxes are paying for you know, the military to be doing these things to other human beings. So yeah, um, I would definitely like to, you know, at the very least, reach out to my representatives and, and let them know, like, you know, I don't, I don't want to be contributing to this kind of oppression. And I have a question that's going to go off script. So if you, if you don't want to answer it, just to say so. But um, before I talk to you last term, I wouldn't have realized that Japan basically annexed Okinawa. Like it's, you know, it's not, it wasn't meant to be one happy country. So I'm wondering, like, what is your identity? Like, does it bother you when someone just says, oh, I know Risa, she's from Japan or something like that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you for asking. Um... So yeah, many people do not know Japan next the Ryukyu Kingdom. Um, you know, even like, I think many people know about Ainu people in Hokkaido as indigenous people in Japan. Um, but the Japanese government finally recognized them as indigenous group in 2019. So we have so much like, so much things to do and it's a long way to go. Um, and also when it comes to my identity, like, yes, I would prefer to be introduced as Orisa oh, is from Okinawa, you know, oh, she's not Japanese, she's Okinawan. So that's how I identify myself. Like I identify as my, um, you know, as an Okinawan woman. Um, so yeah, I feel like when I talked about resistance, it also reminds me of the importance of storytelling. So that's that can be a form of resistance to be. I to be honest, I don't know. That, that's what I feel because, like, you know, I also identify myself as like grandmother's granddaughter. I had a really good relationship with her, so she told me so many things. She survived World War II, so she shared her experience with me. Um, but the Japanese government tried to hide it or like rewrite their history. They're trying to tell us like, oh no, the Japanese soldier didn't kill Okinawans. They were nice to Okinawans or something like that. But, you know, because I heard those stories, I know that's not true. 
So, you know, and then I can pass these stories down to future generations. So that can be a resistance, you know, like, no, that's not true. You cannot manipulate us, you know. Um, so this is why I have a really strong identity. Like I learned so many things from my grandma and then I feel responsible to pass those things down to future generations. And then so they can do more than survive, you know, they can thrive, whatever they want to do, whatever they want to become. And then we always like, as I share, like growing up in Okinawa. So, you know, those institutions tell us like, oh no, you're Japanese, you're not. Like don't have any identity as Okinawan. It's a shame, it's a stigma, you know? But I was like, you know, there were so many bad, like, I like I was so confused. <laughs> I had been really confused all um, all the time. So, um, yeah, that's why I totally understand. So I'm okay. I prefer to be recognized as Japanese because that's what they learned. That's what they have been told to be. Um, and then you know, you cannot be successful if you are not Japanese. Also, that's why you know, it's better for them to hide, hide or like ignore their heritage. So I totally understand. So I, this is why I came to the US and I learned those things and I realized that I went to JD. So I cannot impose what I know, what I learned on those people. Um, rather I love to share, you know, sit down and talk like, oh, this is what I learned. Do you wanna hear, do you wanna talk? You know, that's my approach. Um, so personally, I prefer to be recognized as an Okinawan person, but I cannot impose how I identify myself on other Okinawan people. That's a really good answer, Risa. Thank you for, for telling us that. Um, Mia, do you have any final questions? I think um, my mind was just kind of like thinking about assimilation a lot. But you kind of touched on that, Risa, um, and how, you know, you feel uncomfortable to impose um, how you identify on other people, with other people. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if you would like mind to share more about how assimilation comes up for Okinawan people, especially um, with like, the two colonization forces happening um and then like it's obviously like a tool of survival um to assimilate to be called Japanese or whatever it is but um like how can we um begin to uproot that that framework of thinking um, and I think that comes from education, but I also want to hear from you and what you think. Yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you for asking. Um, so when it comes to assimilation, I feel like I should go back to the um, history too, because after World War II, assimilation um, got accelerated actually. So um, in education, especially as you mentioned, um, so that's my mother's generation. And then at school, students were prohibited to use Okinawan languages. And then I should know that there are like five major category, categories of <laughs> Okinawan languages. So it's like multiple, like it's not a monolithic language. Um, so students are prohibited to use those languages, those indigenous languages, and then when they used, um, they had to hang like dialect placard, which was called Hogan Fuda in Japanese. And then they had to hang it around their neck whole day. So that was a huge stigma or a huge shame. So that practice, that assimilation, um, transformed our identity into shame or, you know, stigma. So that was a huge assimilation practice. And then I learned those colonial tactics <laughs> have, has, um, has been conducted on many indigenous communities. Um, so that's why, as you mentioned, like 
being a simulator is also a survival tactic for people living in the, you know, under colonization. And then also when it comes to the US colonization, um, it's really complicated, I would say. And then personally, I feel there's a kind of tacit notion like, oh, I, Asians are supposed to serve for the US or serve for white people, something like that. Um, I definitely see, you know, American exemptionalism, like, oh, the US is awesome. Like, that's good you have, you have US military base. That means, oh, you can, you'd be able to learn English from them or, oh, you kind of like, you can have more opportunities to learn about American culture or something like that. Um, white supremacy, definitely, you know, that's what I see. <laughs> uh, white supremacy all over the world. Um, but it's really hard to see because Japan, Japanese government tried to um, show themselves and also um, tell us like, oh, Japan is, like racially and ethnically monolithic, I mean, mono, what, what was that? Homo, homogeneous? What was that word? <laughs> Is that correct? Okay. Homogenous, I think. Yeah, yeah you, you got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So that's, that's the message they're trying to feed us. So it's really hard to see, um, you know, this is definitely American exemptionism and white supremacy going on. Uh, so, you know, those are like multi-layer and then that's what's going on. Then also as a core, like the first layer. And then, I mean, I mean, second, you know, ugh, I'm not good at explaining things, sorry. <laughs> so like as a first layer, like we have, Japanese colonial message, you know, like, oh, you're not supposed to be, like there are no minorities or there are no indigenous people in Japan. What you're thinking is wrong. You know, that's the first layer. Then the second layer, like, oh, something American is excellent, you know, but no, like I have, like we have observed so many cases of rape and then violence and even hit and run and then, Recently, more and more girls are like they they raped, so um, which is not okay. So, um, yeah. So this is why we have so many layers or so many components to unpack in order to understand what it's what's going on in Okinawa. Mia, should we start to wrap up? Do you have another question? Um, I don't have another question, but I just wanted to say, Risa, that what you were talking about, um, especially like with Japan, trying to tell people that Japan is a homogenous nation, that there's like no minorities or anything, it really reminded me of Mexico and like the push for like the mestizaje and just like um, bringing together, trying to bring together like a nation of people um, while erasing like indigenous histories and trying to like very much succeeding in their like um, their effort to like just sell people on that it's a it's a kind of a homogenous nation and largely leaving out like an indigenous um, history in that so yeah that I just want to mention the relationship there that my brain was thinking about and yeah it it's a lot of what you're talking about is um too familiar and a story um not specifically about okinawan people haven't learned about this history yet until now so thank you very much um but similar histories um that are familiar just from my indigenous feminisms class or different things from the, I've been learning from the ethnic studies department. So yeah, the saying that 
feels too familiar and that's uncomfortable that this is um, largely what's happening around the world and has been happening, is happening right now. So yeah, um, but I'm very grateful to have listened to you today, Risa. Um, I definitely want to do more of my own research. Like I know that this was labor for you to, you know, talk to even just like talk with us about this, but it's very much appreciated. Um, and definitely want to be doing my own research as well and seeing like, I mean, you mentioned writing letters, but also like, I um, like to paint. So thinking about projects like that as well, that, you know, just to spread awareness, but this, uh, this really helped me. Um, understand more. So thanks, Risa, for that. And I'm sure we'll help the AYA community as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, I should also mention, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention, uh, but early this year or last year, um, the Berkeley Council um, passed the resolution about the US relocation, military-based relocation. And then we Ask as China might have remember, I asked so many people to uh, write email to representatives in Berkeley, and then then they passed the resolution. So that's what we can do. Like there's a successful case, so we would definitely appreciate if you could write emails or something. So thank you for sharing. I had wanted to ask about Berkeley, so I'm glad you brought that up and. Um, and I'll say basically what Mia was saying. I, I know it's not easy when, when we invite someone on and say like, basically tell us the terrible things that are happening to your people. So I really appreciate that you're you know, willing to explain so much for the community that might not know this history and what's happening now. And um, we'll let you have the final word. Anything else you wanna add? Um, no, I just really appreciate that you provide this opportunity to talk about what is going on and then how like our people are suffering. So I really appreciate that you had me today. And also, this is my great honor to be here. So thank you so much. We're honored to have you, Risa. Thank you so much. And thanks to the AYA community. We also want to thank KVBR for producing the episode for us. And we'll, um, We'll see you in the, the next episode. Bye, everyone.